So with that in mind, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, give the screen over to Dr. Sims. So, all right, good. So this is uh, talk number three for this uh, initial portion, um, and I'll try to be uh, not as vocal as much as I was. So hopefully people are hanging in there okay with this. This is kind of a long session, hopefully not too dry. But uh, again, I do think that uh, probably didn't do it justice, but the uh, un understanding of the x-rays is, is just so critical to what you, how you treat acetabular fractures and having some success in the operating room. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about decision making. And again, we want to talk a little bit about the early evaluation and management. We'll talk about surgical indications and then a, a brief overview of the choice of approach. The idea is that when, when the other presenters go through their specific talks, they will go through a lot of the choice of approach with you as well. So this will just be an introduction to it. So um, again, I don't think we need to dwell on the fact that you, a good history is important to understand the injury. You need to know whether there was a previous dislocation or not uh, and what the patient's expectations are and their pre-injury status. Uh, the physical exam is important. Uh, in particular, you need to document uh, the condition of the soft tissues and the neurologic exam and the, you know, whether the perineal and tibial branches of the sciatic nerve are functioning is, uh, is critical to evaluate initially. Uh, the question always comes up, do these patients need traction while they're waiting for surgery? And I would say that not everybody does. The ones that need traction are those that you have a concern for mechanical wear, which usually is from having either uh, a fragment within the joint that might be rubbing on the femoral head while you're waiting for surgery, or you're having a difficult time keeping the head reduced, meaning that it's subluxating enough that you're afraid the head is going to rub on fracture fragments and cause a problem. Uh, the other reason to do it is to just improve the fracture position for surgery. This is particularly important for both column fractures, as we'll see. So the ones that I have a hard time keeping reduced and that I'm worried about rubbing are usually the ones with a very large or superior posterior wall, as you see here. No amount of pulling in the world will make that stay in place. You can pull it down in place, but it will tend to drift uh, back out because there's not enough of the superior acetabulum to maintain that in the hip. The other ones we see are these transtectal transverse fractures where the head will tend to follow the ischiopubic segment. And because the only remaining portion of the articular surface is that tiny little place right there, keeping these reduced can be very difficult. And uh, I think these, if you can get them reduced and put them in traction while you're waiting, then hopefully they'll stay reduced and not uh, have to be uh, rushed to the operating room immediately to take care of that. The uh, other uh, is situation again with the both column fracture where the, the, you're basically treating the pelvic ring with the traction with this because the uh, acetabulum and the femoral head want to move cranially and, and medially yeah and uh, traction can help you to maintain some, the patient more comfortable and to keep them in better alignment, particularly for those patients that are very sick that might uh, not be able to make it to the operating room for several days before you can get to their surgery. So the initial decisions are always uh, uh, for a specific injury. Uh, does it need to be operated on? If it does, when do you operate? And then what approach do you use to operate on it? And we'll go through a little bit of this. So the choice of surgery or not surgery, Obviously, the patient factors are very important. Um, these include age and functional expectations, the comorbidities or associated injuries that, uh, that we have to consider, and the condition of the soft tissues is important. Uh, with this probably would change your approach and how you would think about the fracture and maybe even whether you would operate or not. Um, fracture factors are important, and when I think about the fracture, I think about the uh, classification, I think about the location, the displacement, the congruency of the hip, and whether the hip is going to be stable or not once it's uh, in the position it's in. So uh, the fracture location, and we know that fractures that involve the weight-bearing dome uh, that are left displaced tend to have a negative outcome. Uh, there is some, we would like to think, and it's usually true, that if it does not involve the weight-bearing dome, that it does have a, at least a good chance to have a, a, a good prognosis. So defining the weight-bearing dome uh, has been attempted in, in several ways. One uh, for the transverse family of fractures is with these, these roof arc angles. This is done by drawing a plumb line uh, through to the center of the femoral head, and then a line from the center of the head through the edge of the fracture where it exits the articular surface. And then uh, that gives us a roof arc angle. We can then do that on the AP, the obturator oblique, and the iliac oblique view, which gives us our medial roof arc, our anterior roof arc, and our posterior roof arc, which now gives us uh, the upper aspect of the dome of the weight-bearing portion of the acetabulum. Uh, if we can see this and, and uh, gives us some idea about whether the where the fracture exits, if these are all less than, if any of these are less than 45 degrees, then it probably involves the weight-bearing dome of the acetabulum. And uh, at least in a fairly significant series from MATA and from others, this, uh, that those that are outside of this 45-degree uh, angle seem to do fine uh, without being operated on. So 
as long as the hip remained congruent out of traction. Uh, CT scans have been used to try to correlate this with what these 45 degree arcs would be, uh, give us what that weight bearing dome would be. And what, what was discovered is the top 10 millimeters on the CT scan equals about a 45 degree roof arc angle. This is some work from Steve Olson and Joel Mata. Uh, so the way I look at this in the op you know, my CT scans, and these are ones with two millimeter cuts here, you can see that the subchondral uh, condensation at the superior portion of the acetabulum here. And if you start counting down, that's two millimeters to the next cut, four millimeters to the next cut, still hasn't entered into the joint six millimeters and we're still not into the joint yet, eight millimeters and now we're into the joint. So at about eight millimeters, somewhere between six and eight millimeters, this exits into the joint. So this involves the weight bearing dome, the upper 10 millimeters of the acetabulum and would be somebody that would probably meet criteria to be operated on. There's some controversy about this. This is a study from Mark Barris where they looked at transverse fractures and in uh, and, and, and some cadaver specimens and, uh, and loaded these and, they came up with these numbers here for what's important that the anterior roof arc could be as low as 25 degrees and the posterior maybe needs to be as much as 70 degrees. To, this was not been validated clinically, but again, just another way to think about it, that maybe the posterior roof arc uh, might be more important than the anterior roof arc in some situations. Congruency is uh, just to whether they, these are symmetric of the joint. And if you look, it can be fairly subtle. As you see here, this transverse fracture on this side is a congruent joint on the other side uh, you have to think about where the weight bearing dome actually is and there's the fracture there's the weight bearing dome and the head has again moved medially and followed the ischiopubic segment and this is a non-congruent hip and somebody out of traction that you would probably consider for a surgical treatment if they're a young healthy patient incarcerated fragments can give you a non-congruent fragment and joint and you can see how widely uh, this wide this joint is uh, even though the fragment that you see on the CT scan is quite small. So it only takes a small rock in your shoe or a very small fragment to actually cause a problem and make this look very bad. This concept of secondary congruency, we'll hear about this when we hear about both column fractures. But again, the concept is that the labrum remains intact. The capsule might be intact as well for some of these both column fractures. And that the fracture fragments may just rotate around the femoral head. Um, and as long as the uh, acetabulum itself is not too far immediately displaced or otherwise and it's congruent on all three views then there is uh, some uh, uh, some possibility that treating these non-operatively could end up with a reasonably good result. Posterior wall fractures are unique and Dr. Johnson will talk about these but these are based on size and those that are greater than 50 percent of the diameter are pretty much universally unstable. It's that 20 to 50 percent that tend to be a little bit more of a difficult situation and those are the ones where stress exam and again Dr. Johnson will talk to you a little bit more about that uh, can be helpful. So if you think about it again non-operative treatment can be done for considered for those that have a congruent joint out of traction on all three views in the plain x-rays. Um, they have uh, a fracture or they have a fracture that's outside of the weight bearing dome, which means roof arc greater than 45 degrees. They have less than two millimeters of displacement, um, some small posterior wall fractures, and uh, in, in some situations, those people have secondary surgical congruence. Uh, again, the other way to think about it is the indications for surgery are those that don't have a congruent joint, those with more than two millimeters of displacement through the weight bearing dome, posterior wall fractures where they're unstable, and those that have retained fragments. The timing of surgery, um, again, should be basically when the patient is medically optimized um, and, uh, and no signs of systemic infection. Um, delaying surgery can be detrimental. Uh, in the initial series from Lettron Elamata, they changed their approach after three weeks. Uh, there was some initial work from uh, Peter Warlock where they looked at it, they said at 15 days for the elementary patterns and even as early as five days for the associated patterns, they had a poorer reduction and a more difficult time with their surgery. Uh, and there's some work from uh, from uh, Case Western, uh, from Heather Valero, that looked at the uh, early fixation may be beneficial to the health of the patient, uh, even as early as within the first 24 hours is probably beneficial, and maybe there is not increased blood loss. So I think that the, basically the answer is you do it as, as soon as you can, as soon as you have the right team and the patient is in the right status. Uh, as far as any urgent treatment, the only real indications would be open fractures, those with a very large retained fragment, particularly those ones that make it irreducible, um, and those that have a progressive neurologic deficit. 
a choice of approach. We have a lot of choices for approaches, but the uh, I think the the basis the the, the, the workhorses are the Coker Langenbach, the ilioinguinal, or some variation of the ilioinguinal, meaning maybe just working through the medial window that has been modified for the uh, intrapelvic approach, um, or uh, or combinations of the windows of the ilioinguinal, uh, and and then extended approaches for those uh, for sp very specific fractures or combined approaches in some situations as well. So um, just briefly, because people will cover on these, uh, but the coker Langenbeck, we know that it will give us the exposure that you see here uh, to that portion of the acetabulum. So I think if you understand where your fracture is and you draw it out, then you can think through what approach is gonna allow you to see what you need to be able to see. Um, and as we'll hear from, hear from uh, Phil Krieger in just a few minutes, that uh, you can extend this a little bit by doing a, a digastric osteotomy to see a little bit more in the cranial direction and a little bit more in the anterior direction to give you ability to operate on some fractures that might have been more difficult to a standard coker lying back. These are the fracture patterns that are uh, the ones in black are pretty much the, one, the ones that are almost always operated on through a coker lying back. Um, and then most transverse fractures and most T-shaped fractures will be addressed that way. The ilioinguinal, well, uh, again, that you see the anterior wall, anterior column, anterior plus posterior image transverse, and both columns are almost, almost all treated through the ilioinguinal or a version of it, uh, whether you wanna just use the, the medial and lateral window or just a medial window or all three windows or, or, or a different combination of those. And then some transverse fractures can be addressed this way as well. The extended iliofemoral approach is uh, reserved for uh, specific uh, both column fractures that we'll hear more about when we talk about both column fractures, occasional T-shaped fractures um, as well. And, but, um, and mostly for those associated fracture patterns that are greater than three weeks old, uh, that we need to be able to do see within the joint to, to, to do the final reduction. The specific both column fracture that uh, is uh, probably better addressed to an extended iliofemoral is one like this, where they have this uh, um, uh, both column uh, fracture that involves the, uh, the SI joint fracture dislocation, so that the portion that's actually intact is just this part that you see in blue. So to build the posterior column back to that, the sacrum completely blocks that portion. You can't see it from inside the pelvis and that these are sometimes better operated in young patients from the outside of the pelvis. So we'll wrap it up here. So again, I think uh, decision mation, we talked a little bit about the early evaluation and management, some surgical indications, and then a choice, uh, just an overview of the choice of approaches that will be uh, talked about in much more detail in the talks that will be upcoming over the next uh, several weeks.